Okay, um, morning one and all again. Um, today we are going to be in 1 Samuel 18. I've got a number of passages to read, so we're not just going to stay there. But uh, what I will recommend is that you keep your hand in 1 Samuel. Because we're going to be looking today at David, Jonathan and Saul in particular. So you could turn your Bible to the first chapter, oh, sorry, to 1 Samuel chapter 18. I'm going to read from verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 18, reading from verse 1. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day, and would let him go no more to his father's house. And then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him, and gave it to David, and his garments even to his sword, and to his bow, and to his girdle. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul, with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played, and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from, David from that day forward. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, and was departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from him, and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Let's just commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Lord and Father, we thank you for thy word, that we can have a copy of thy perfect, unchanged, and holy word. Lord, what a blessing it is to be able to read a copy this morning. Lord, we just pray that you'll speak through me, and Lord, that your work in our hearts Lord, just use me as an instrument. Let them hear thee. Lord, bless our meeting together this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right, okay, so I'm going to look at three things today. Um, what, so I'm going to look at Jonathan as a picture of the church. I'm going to look as da at David as a picture of Christ. I'm going to look at Saul as a picture of the world. Now, I was talking to um, Colin yesterday, and I said, um, I couldn't find anything on this particular type of analogy anywhere, so it's possible I'm completely barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> However, you, you know, it's worth preaching. Um, I woke up one morning, this was in my mind, and so I thought the Lord has put it on my heart. I would be very interested to know what you think at the end. I really would be. Um, as with any picture, um, it's not. It's never going to be 100% perfect. Even with David, David is generally considered a type of Christ. There's little debate on that. Very little debate. However, he is not Christ. And that's key. There are differences. Christ never sinned. But David did. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. Um, David is not God's 
Son. He's not God made manifest in the flesh. But Jesus Christ is. So as I say, with any type, we have to bear in mind it's a picture. It's never going to be a perfect, 100% covers everything example. Um, just trust it's going to be a blessing to you this morning. It was a blessing to me as I was bearing it. So um, for me, it's been a great, great joy to be able to study this. Okay. One thing I will say, we're going to be spending a lot of time in First and Second Samuel, so keep your hand somewhere in that region, because we will be turning to other passages of Scripture as well. But do make sure that you've got your hand somewhere in this vicinity. So, the first thing we need to know is that Saul is a picture of the world. How? How is Saul a picture of the world? Why have I come to this impression? Several reasons. One... He disobeys God's command. What is sin other than transgression of the law? The Bible says all have sinned. Saul is no different. Saul sinned. And if we look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, we can read about uh, what happened. So you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to read quite a large chunk of this poor, this uh, this particular passage. First Samuel 15. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. That's really key, that verse is, because you're going to read on further exactly what happens. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telaim, 2,000 footmen, 200,000 footmen, and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek, and lay wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. What did it say in verse 3? It says, destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. But what did he say in verse 9? But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. He disobeyed God's command. And we can look on Saul very harshly, can't we? And forget that actually all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That there is none righteous, no, not one. In this way, and many others, Saul is a picture of the world. What happens next? Verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, He repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and he's gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, 
I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this? Bleating of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have destroyed. Notice there, the first thing he says in verse 13, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But he hadn't. He was told to destroy everything to do with the Amalekites, and hadn't. He spared King Agag himself, it says. So, he's lied here. He's gone and lied. What does the Bible say about the world? The Bible says that we, we, we all sin. We all lie. Children from a very young age learn that skill. A very young age. Um, scientific study carried out years and years ago. I've probably said this in sermons before. Um, they have a table laid with all sorts of items. Uh, and they've got a cloth over it. And they say to the child, only three years old, two years old, don't look under the sheet. And when I come back, I will give you a reward. The man then leaves the room. The child doesn't realise it, but they're being filmed. The child then sneaks a good old looky-loo at the, uh, the item underneath the blanket, puts it down, and the man returns. Did you look under the sheet? Almost every single one. No, I did not look under the. No, I did not look under the sheet. They lied. You don't need to teach a child to sin. It's part of their nature. And in this way, Saul is a picture of the world because he disobeyed God's word and he lied. And then we read in First Samuel eighteen, verse seven and eight. The passage that we read to start with this morning, only slightly right of where we were. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul have slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth and he, the same displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands. And to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what more can he have more but the kingdom? He's jealous. He's envious. This is pride speaking, isn't it? He's upset that David has been told that he's killed his tens of thousands. He wants to be the number one man in town. That's how he feels. He's jealous. He's envious. And this comes from a place of pride. He thinks it should be him. It should be him at the top of the food chain. That's what he thinks. And what's... what's um, what was it that led Satan to fall? It was pride. It was pride. He lifted up his heart, it says. And we all have pride. But then, what do we notice? He's disobeyed God's word. He's lied. He's jealous. He's envious. He's proud. We all experience these things. But in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, we read, and this is key now, this is really key to this picture, I think. We're going to look at two verses here, verse 1 and verse 14. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for he provided me a king among his sons. And if you look at verse 14. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. His relationship with God was broken. It was broken. When was that relationship with man broken? It was broken back in the Garden of Eden. When Adam fell, and Eve fell. And here... His relationship with God is broken. And in that way, he's a picture of the world. He has a broken relationship. And every single person, if you have not put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your relationship with God is broken. It's, it's non-existent. You don't have a relationship. 
the way to have a relationship, put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And so we have here a picture of Saul as a picture of the world. Because he lied, he was disobedient, he was jealous, envious, proud, and he has this broken relationship with God. And then we come to David. A complete contrast. He's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both were from Bethlehem. We read in here, in verse 1 of chapter 16, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So, David was a man from Bethlehem. As was Jesus. Both were kings. We read in 2 Samuel 5 verse 3. And as I say, keep your hands in sort of 2 Samuel and 1 Samuel. But we are going to be sort of switching to the New Testament for a bit now as well. We're going to keep coming back to 1 and 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 5 verse 17 says this. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it, and went down to the hold. Here, David is king. Now, when we turn to the New Testament, we can turn to uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 25. I know that here, when he had his earthly ministry... He was never set up as king. And that won't happen until the millennial. In the millennium, he will be king. He will be ruler. That's what the Bible teaches us in books like Zechariah. When it says about how his feet will touch on the Mount of Olives. And how he will then go on to reign. But in Mark chapter 15, we see this, this picture. Verse 25. And it was about the third hour. And they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. Jesus is a king and he will reign. The Bible makes it very, very clear. There is absolutely no debate on this. He will one day reign. Then if we look at 2 Samuel 5 verse 17... Verse 17, again, what's the other thing that we notice about David? But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David over king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it, and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. The Philistines were David's enemy. David had enemies in the same way that Jesus Christ had enemies. In John chapter 15, the book of John, and chapter 15... Verse 17 to 19, we read. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Have I turned to the right passage here? John chapter 15, verse 17. Oh, I'm reading the wrong verses, that's why. 17 to 19, sorry about that. Right. John chapter 15, 17 to 19. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of this world, the world would love his own, but because ye are not of this world, I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. The world hated Jesus Christ. Why else did they nail him to the cross? Why else did they, they hand him over to Pilate? Why else did they spit at him? Why else did they buffet him? Why did they plant the crown of thorns upon him? Because they hated him. 
What did it say about the chief priests and the rulers? They moved out of jealousy. They wanted him dead. Jesus Christ had his enemies and David had his enemies as well. We notice, I'm not going to read the entirety of these passages now because they would go on there. They're quite long chapters. But they both prophesied as well, didn't they? David was a prophet, as was Jesus Christ. They both prophesied. Psalm 22 is a good example of that. And this is David writing, and some of what he's writing would not have happened to him. I mean, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The words that Jesus Christ used upon the cross, David said, I can actually picture David saying that. But what I can't picture is this. Uh, verse 16 of Psalm 22. For the dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. This is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's, there's a load of prophecies, and particularly in the book of Psalms, that David makes. So clearly, he prophesied. And Jesus Christ prophesied in Matthew 24. What do we read at the very start? I'm not going to read the entirety of this. Matthew chapter 24, um, and verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us... When shall these things be? Or what shall be the sign of the coming and of the end of the world? And then Jesus goes on, talk about um, what's going to happen at the end of the world. So in that instance, they're both prophets. Both shepherds as well. Both shepherds. 1 Samuel 16, verse 11. And this is why I say keep your fingers in Samuel. 1 Samuel 16, verse 11, we read. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And what do we read in John chapter 10, verse 4? John chapter 10, verse 4. And when he put forth his own sheep, John chapter 10 verse 4, have I misread that as well? 14. God, I need to get my eyes checked. John chapter 10 verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. You know, there are examples of good shepherds in the Bible. Abel being one of them. He kept sheep. Um, David being another. He really went out of his way for the sheep. And Jesus Christ being the final one. But the big difference there is, David wasn't perfect. Abel wasn't perfect. Jesus Christ is perfect. And this is what I'm saying to you. A type can only go so far. It's never going to be 100%. And what you've also got to remember is there are examples of bad shepherds in the Bible. And there's examples of bad shepherds in the world today, isn't there? You only have to um, to walk down the road and, well, you only have to look at some of the other churches this morning. I remember um, when we used to travel to Hope Chapel on the Sunday mornings. There was a church not far from there. And outside this church, they got an advertisement. Got no problem with the advertisements, really. Um, but it depends on what the advertisement has. This one didn't have a Bible verse. This one had the meeting times. Well, nothing that's important. This one had the location. I think that was important. No Bible verse. No mention of Jesus Christ. No mention of anything like that. It said, come in for donuts and coffee. That was their way of bringing them in. And bear in mind, somebody's in charge of that church. That church has a shepherd. Good shepherd or bad shepherd? Don't know. I wouldn't like to say entirely. Maybe. Maybe the church is absolutely fine once you get inside. I think it's unlikely, but maybe. I remember one day, we were at the youth group years ago, and um, another church came to join us. Well, they've 
basically the pastor of this other church came down to sort of to have a conversation with us. He said, oh, um, we want to get together. We want to get all the young people in the churches together. Well, for a Bible study? No, not a Bible study. Okay? Maybe to, to pray? No, not to pray. To sumo wrestle? <laughs> to sumo wrestle in a church? So when I say to you there are examples of good shepherds and bad shepherds, it's something that's pretty well established, and we know it. I could go into so much more here, um, but time is not going to permit it. If we're going to get through this, time is not going to permit it. There are many other ways in which David is a type of Christ. It is not exhaustive. This is from, I'm going to read you something that Jonathan Edwards wrote. He, um, he also wrote a book called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's a really good book. I read it years ago. Um, I think, have you got any copies downstairs? Colin's got copies downstairs, but this is what Jonathan Edwards says. David is spoken of and as, uh, as an eminently holy person, a man after God's own heart. He is spoken of in the history of the kings of Judah as one whose heart was perfect with the Lord his God, 1 Kings 11.4. One that went fully after the Lord, 1 Kings 11.6. One that did right in the eyes of the Lord, 1 Kings 15.11. He is spoken of as pure and upright and righteous, one that had clean hands, that kept the ways of the Lord and did not wickedly depart from God. We could go in, you could spend hours just looking at this picture of David as a type of Christ. It's a wonderful picture. It's also a picture that we ought to be emanating ourselves. We ought to be Christ like. That's what the Bible tells us. We ought to be Christ-like. So, we come to Jonathan. We've looked at Saul as a picture of the world. We've looked at David as a picture of Christ. We're going to look at Jonathan now as a picture of the church. And we come to 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 to 4, from the passage that we read to start with. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul... For the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day, and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him, and gave it to David, and his garments even to his sword, and to his bow, and to his girdle. You cannot be saved and not love the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, it says that Jonathan loved David, loved him as his own soul. What is the church, other than a body of believers who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation, who are acknowledged that he died and was buried and rose again, who love the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what the church is. It's the believers bought, redeemed through his blood. I don't believe it's personally possible to be a Christian and not love the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that the two are completely hand in hand. I don't know what you think about that. Be interested to know what you think. I think when you become a Christian, I think that you, you, you love the Lord because you understand what he did for you. You understand that he took your sin upon himself. You understand that he went to the cross of Calvary, that he was pierced, that he shed his blood. You understand everything he did for you. How can you not love him? You understand that he promised to never leave you nor forsake you. You've promised that he's promised that nothing shall separate you from his love. How can you not love him? And what does the Bible say? We love him because he first loved us. Here, Jonathan shows his love. He says he loved David, a type of Christ, as he loved his own soul. And what do we read here? It says that Jonathan and David made a covenant. Christ established the new covenant through his blood. 
Just as David and Jonathan had a covenant, we are part of this new covenant. Hebrews 10, verse 29. So turning towards the end of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 10. Um, I'm not going to profess that I'm that strong on the book of Hebrews. I think Hebrews is a very challenging book. It's a very big, there's great blessing in the book of Hebrews. It's an important book. I just, I wouldn't turn around and say I'm an expert on Hebrews in any way, shape or form. But Hebrews 10 verse 29 says this. Of how much sore a punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite unto the Spirit of grace. The covenant... The blood of the covenant. This new covenant. Just as Jesus Christ established a covenant uh, through his blood, purchasing the church, David and Jonathan had a covenant as a picture of Christ and the church. Jonathan, it says, gives to David says here, and Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. What does it say in Romans chapter 12? Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. So we've got um, get, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then we come to Romans. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. I'm a little bit dyslexic today. I just I nearly turned to chapter 1, verse 12. Right, chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We are commanded to present our bodies a living sacrifice. We should want to serve him. We should want to give the Lord Jesus Christ everything that we have. We should want to serve him. We should be a living sacrifice, the Bible tells us. Just as Jonathan gave to David, Jonathan, a picture of the church, gave to David a picture of Christ, we ought to give ourselves as well a living sacrifice. We should give our energy, our time, our efforts, our money to the Lord, our Saviour. He's not interested in our, in our good works, in that sense, but he's interested in us. He's interested in our time. How much time do we give to the Lord? And this is a challenge to me as much as anything else because I, I know for a fact I don't spend anywhere near as much time as I ought to. I, I ought to do a lot more. And I think you can, become, you can feel quite guilty about that. I think you dwell on it. When you consider everything the Lord Jesus Christ did for us, I think you can feel a bit guilty. But, that's by the by. We ought to present ourselves a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Jonathan testified to David of Saul. And we see that in 1 Samuel 19 verse 4. 1 Samuel 19, verse 4. And Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee ward very good. Jonathan, as a picture of the church, he testifies of David, a picture of Christ, to Saul, a picture of the world. We ought to be going into the world and preaching the gospel. We ought to teach them what Jesus Christ has done for them. How Jesus Christ loves them. How he died for them. How he shed his blood for them. The Bible commands it. It says in Mark 16 verse 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Um, I would... I do think you have to be a little bit careful there. Um, John, not Jonathan Edwards, it was a Christmas, famous preacher, Christmas Evans, was it? Christmas Evans. He first preached his, his, he preached his first sermon to a field of sheep. I'm only guessing, but I doubt any of those sheep were saved. 
okay? Um, I'm speaking uh, flippantly there. But we are commanded to preach the gospel. We're commanded to tell others. I I think about it like this. Um, How often do I talk to my own neighbours, the people who live nearest to me? We post through a calendar every year. That's pretty much it. Is that sufficient? I don't know. Um, And do bear this in mind, I'm not just saying this towards you, I'm also thinking about myself here. We are commanded to preach the gospel, and we ought to want to preach the gospel. Because the gospel is good news. It is that Jesus Christ loves you and died for you. It is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is good news. It is something to be excited about. It's something to want to tell others about. It's so sad that we live in a day where we'll turn around to each other and say, have you seen this movie? It's excellent. One of the best films I've ever seen. But we can't turn around and say, the Lord Jesus Christ loves us. That's the kind of world we live in today. And obviously, this is one of the saddest bits I remember reading. Um, if we continue down from verse 5 in chapter 19 of First Samuel... We read to verse 6, And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swear, As the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all the things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. And it continues on. For some reason, I didn't write down the reference to this last one. Mm. Pause. Red one. I'm colour blind. The one on the right. One on the right where it says record. Or stop. (laughs) What we do know is this. Jonathan's love for David appears to be greater than his love for Saul. Why do I say that? Because he helped David to hide, helped him get away, cared for him. And this is something that we need to remember as believers. Yes, we can never leave the world, just as Jonathan couldn't really leave his father. We're in the world, but we ought to love the Lord Jesus Christ more. That's really important. I think the problem with today is we have so much entertainment. We have so many things that we can do. I mean, in this particular civilization, at this point in time, you can spend a thousand years just watching TV. There are that many shows out there, that many films. You can live a life of entertainment in the world. But it's more important. It's a greater blessing to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and to have that relationship with him. To be able to spend time with him. That is the greater thing. That is the better thing. So in these ways, I've summed up today how Saul is a picture of the world through his actions, through his lying, his deceit, everything else. How David is a picture of Christ, both kings, both prophets. And now Jonathan is a picture of the church in that Jonathan's love for David is greater than his love for Saul, or at least that's what he appears to be, in that um, Jonathan professed his love, in that Jonathan had a relationship with David. Amen.